Goedemiddag dames en heren. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this whole session will be in English and as you can hear, English is not my first language. So please bear with me for the next uh, hour. Um, welcome. Welcome to the screening of The Deal. My name is Baram Sadeghi and uh, I have the honor and maybe the big res responsibility to be your moderator today. Please don't forget to put your phone on silent mode. Take your time for, to put it on silent mode. And this program, the screening and the conversation after the screening is a part of the, the Vluchtroute Reeks. That's for the 21st time that we are organizing this, uh, these uh, sessions here, Vluchtroute or the escape route. And the central question in uh, the Vluchtroute is how to um, create an atmosphere in Amsterdam, maybe in bigger Amsterdam or in Holland, to make uh, refugees, asylum seekers, a little bit at ease, a little bit as their home here. That's the central question. And today's program is about the documentary The Deal. It's made by Els van Driel and Effie uh, van uh, Blankenfort. They are here with us and maybe they can uh, participate a little bit. Maybe I have a question for you or the audience have a question for you later after the film. And it's all about the EU-Turkey deal. And I'm sure that you are all know about this deal. Probably you can dream the deal. But just for one or two of your uh, people who just a little bit, you know, what was the deal about? You know, let me um, tell you the most essential parts of the deal. Uh, it was two years ago that it started. And in this deal, uh, Turkey agreed to step up its border security to shelter more Syrian refugees and readmit refugees that have entered EU from Turkey. In exchange, the EU would give Turkey 6 billion euros, that is 6 milliard euros, uh, uh, to assist uh, Turkey in taking up the refugees, in which the EU also promised to resettle Syrian refugees from Turkey and accelerate the visa uh, liberalization for Turkish uh, citizens. Uh, the visa deals, as you, of visum deals, as you waarschijnlijk weten. And the aim of today is to, to inform you about the current situation, especially on uh, island Lesbos, and the impact of the deal on refugees and the situation, maybe uh, at large on Lesbos. And the other thing is, and maybe that's as important as the, the, the first uh, the, uh, part, is to give, uh, to um, bring on some um, initiatives to highlight them, uh, which are currently taking place to improve the situation on Lesbos, um, which maybe inspire you to join them or maybe you start your own action and to look closer to, this, uh, um, to these initiatives and these actions to, say, to see what can we do. And for this purpose, we have a couple of people. They will join me after the movie. The movie will take 52 minutes. So let's say about six o'clock, we start the conversation. We don't have a break and, uh, and the conversation will take about, let's say 45, 50 minutes. And having said that, uh, Maybe I can uh, tell you one thing about my guests later on. One of the main characters of the movie is here as well. And that's uh, it's amazing that he made it here. You know, he got the visa to come here from Greece to here. Is this uh, Syrian refugee or ex-refugee? How should I call you, Rami? He's a still refugee, Rami. Please stand up. So that's Rami. He just... Uh, from Syria and arrived in Amsterdam especially for this event. Rami, I will see you in 52 minutes. Having said that, I mean, it's, it's a kind of you know, rough movie, so I cannot say uh, have a nice screening, but because it's a rough movie, maybe I can say have a good screening. Okay, start the picture, please.
the feeling that we are looking away of the problem. The real problem. For our guests that they're going to be here in a while, when they come, they are coming a little bit of sad and when they leave, they are leaving laughing and singing and dancing and many nights they are dancing here, we put their music and they have a bit of good time into this bad situation that uh, they live. started the end of 2014. Refugees start coming in Lesbos. 2015 start coming a lot. Some nights we had uh, 200 boats sometimes every night. Each one 70, 80 people. At the beginning, the camp of Moria, I can say maybe was the best camp in Greece. Organizations built it from the beginning um, and taking care, good care of the people. They were close to the people. But they changed it after the deal with Turkey. In a week's time, they ask all volunteers to leave and take their stuff and leave. So now Moria camp is the worst. If you pass outside, you could see the wires and everything. It's a prison. It's not good. The food is not good. All people ask to leave from there because I believe it's a place that if you stay more than a week, you're going to start having psychological problems for sure. صعب جدا وقاسي برد قارس وامطار غزيره وحال الاولاد صعب جدا نحن بحاجه الى مساعده لكي نخرج من هذا الخيمه الصغيره Moria come for right now.
I had to wash my hair for two months because I don't have shampoo. Please, can you give me? I want to brush my teeth, but I don't have a toothbrush. Can you please help me? On winter, they were asking for blankets because they didn't have. And most of them are sleeping inside tents. And on winter, this is not good. Last winter, five people died of cold in Moria camp. Why all these refugees are still in Greece? After so many months after the famous deal. I don't know. Somebody must give answers. I travel a lot around Europe uh, to meet policymakers, give presentations, do research from uh, Strasbourg to Athens, from Rome to Berlin, trying to present policy proposals that might help policymakers solve urgent problems. Like all other Europeans, we were shocked by the images of people drowning off the Turkish or Greek coast in summer 2015. We were also shocked by the, the, the lack of uh, concrete proposals. What might be done to stop people drowning? This standoff continued for many, many months until by early 2016, Viktor Orban had persuaded most governments in Europe that the way to deal with this crisis was to build a big wall north of Greece, to close off, as it was called, the Balkan route and to trap everyone in Greece. And in, in a race against this plan, we had been urging for many, many months to instead make an agreement between Germany and the Netherlands and the EU and Turkey that would not solve the problem at the expense of Greece and by treating refugees badly in an EU member state, but that would seek to replace irregular migration with regular migration and respect the refugee convention. And that, of course, then led to the EU-Turkey statement on the 18th of March, uh, 2016. Let's start again. Moving now to um, Mr. Gerald Knaus, founding chairman of the European Stability Initiative. We have a lot of international experience and one of the people behind the Turkey deal may be responsible for, or he said, well, maybe even to blame for. We are very glad to have him. Thanks a lot. Um, I say you can blame me or my friends, my institution, my colleagues for some of the ideas behind the EU-Turkey agreement. You will see us or you will see me defend them here again. In the first two months of the winter of 2016, 120,000 people crossed in the winter. I don't know how you can make the graph to not make it clear that this is a larger number than crossed in the whole EU in every year before 2014. At all borders, one year later, same time, same coast, in the winter. January, February 2017, you don't have 120,000 people cross, you have 3,000 people cross. I cannot, for the, I, can, I mean, you can criticize the values, you can, but the idea that this didn't make an impact, sorry, talk to anybody on Lesbos or Kios. I love the idea of a better, more creative EU solution. And I definitely don't think we should take away momentum from this. But the momentum in early 2016 was with Viktor Orban and the Balkan route closure. That was the momentum. 25 governments in the EU in March 2016 were in favor of this solution. Not a single government in the EU was in favor of let's uh, not do anything or let's be more generous. What would have been the alternative in March 2016 or, or indeed today to not be theoretical? The EU-Turkey agreement is, is called off. What happens? There you are. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. <laughs> we need these agreements because they keep us alive, but we need to focus on the right issues. That's what I worry about. And, and if we, if we, and, and we need to not 
fall into the trap of the extreme right, which is to say everything's impossible except the harshest I, I, measures. I, I, I completely agree with you because that's, that's playing, dangerous. You're playing their cards. Yeah. 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 This won't be the last discussion no, we will have. No, I'm sure Thank we have Take much. care. Goodbye. The essence of the deal is that all the, all the laws, the refugee convention, remain intact. You would keep the asylum procedure in Greece. You would have fast asylum procedures that decided who was safe and who was not safe. And the goal was that this would reduce the number of people who do not need protection in the EU to get into boats. At the same time, the EU would offer Turkey two things the biggest sum of money in the history of the EU to support refugees in a third country, 6 billion euros for the Syrians in Turkey, and to take refugees, Syrian refugees from Turkey in an orderly way and move them by plane and not by boat and walking to Germany, the Netherlands and France. It, it did save lives. It did reduce the number of arrivals. But on each of the three main ideas, implementation was and remains today very weak. We should not be satisfied. Boats are still arriving. On average, 50 to 60 people a day for the last year. He will touch his mustache and giving a wink. So he will be like doing like this and... So I keep seeing myself in the mirror, how it should be the expression. So I try to give it uh, the same to the character. Back in Syria, I used to be uh, animation uh, supervisor, making uh, 3D animation cartoons, short movies for the kids, commercials for TV channels. When the war starts in Syria, they bring the tanks, they bring the army, they start fighting in the streets. So me and my family was like, we should go right now before it's going crazy. My family decided uh, to go to Germany because my father, he was having heart problem and he needs surgery for his heart. So at that point, I was uh, staying in uh, Turkey, living there, or working with uh, also TV channels there, making animation the same, animation series. And later I get a phone from my older brother and he told me like, Rami will doctor check on your father and his heart is fallen and maybe he will pass away in any moment. And I was like, so what I should do now? The country is going crazy here, explosion everywhere. It's not safe anymore. My father is dying and what I should do. And even if I stay, even I force myself to stay, let's say I will never see my family again. All of them, they are in German now. So I was having many reasons. Actually, I was so much hesitated to take that trip to, to cross to Greece because I was not how much is, is dangerous. So I take the risk, I went to Azmir. I find the smuggler so easy there. They gather us something like 13 people, 11 adults and two children. When we was going in the Turkish water, everything was calm, no problem. When we start going inside the Greek water, the waves start going bigger and bigger. It was different for it. The driver he didn't slow down. He kept going at full speed. Big wave came from the front and he crashed it from the front of the boat. The half of the boat full of water 
the second wave came and it flipped the boat. I swam to the side, when I go up, everyone was around the boat screaming. The most out loud screaming, it was the mother of the child. She was screaming that the two children still stuck down. I tried to reach the kids because the, the boat was like something like that. So just the top of it still up, so they stuck down. So I tried to reach, to reach the, uh, the kids, something like that. So I catch something, I bullet. It was a little girl. The little girl was four years, something like that. When I start swimming, something like a plastic bag hit my shoulder. It was a life jacket. So I was holding the little girl in this arm and the life jacket in the other arm. First two hours, I tried to calm myself down because I, I was thinking there is no exit from this situation. I can't see any boat around us. No, no, still going until the morning. Maybe some boat, fisher boat will show up. I remember something like in cold weather, don't, don't sleep because you will die. I start moving my legs very fast just to reach the blood on my body. One boat maybe came. It was far away, but it was coming toward me. Maybe they saw me. I start screaming, screaming out loud, making splash with my legs. They didn't see me because they just go like that, the other side. I was, I start thinking like, what does that mean? I just want to live my life, see my family, and I never hurt anyone. Why does that happen to me? Every muscles, every bone in my body, it was hurting. When I looked to my right side, I saw another border ship coming, and one guy was waving for me. I, I screamed to him to be sure, actually, even I didn't see him waving. He said, like, we are coming, we are coming, he was waving. So I feel so much relief that uh, they saw me. Uh, when they came, they threw me the rope. I catch the rope. Uh, they asked me to give them the little girl. I noticed uh, that the girl, her face was blue. She was dead already. The little girl that I, I felt like I just disappointed the mother, I disappointed them, I couldn't, I wasn't fast enough. recently went through all the business cards I collected the last four months. Oh, oh, probably hundreds. And I look at this, some of these cards, I say, oh, this is great, I should meet that person. <laughs> like, I met somebody senior from Banff, and recently oh. I was thinking oh. of Christian. Do we know anyone in Banff? And no. I, and I, well, apparently I do, because I have their cards. But yes. I've forgotten it. We had now two years of intense, very heated debates on relocation. Uh, remember in July 2015, the EU decided to relocate 32,000 people. Then in September 2015, Commission President Juncker proposed to add 120,000. There was a, a vote. Two years have passed and we discover not a single one of those 120,000 has been relocated. Tens of thousands of people were left hanging in the air, asylum seekers who lost lifetime 
uh, and there was bureaucracy, it didn't work. People are going to stay, if something dramatic doesn't happen, in tents, again, in a winter, on holiday islands in the Aegean. This is unacceptable when there are at least 500 million euros made available for refugees in Greece. Thanks a lot, very good. Very good, excellent. And I, I did you give me your card? Because I've run out, but I will send you mine. Yeah. Hey, how are you? I'm good to see you. you. Hello. Welcome so, back. yes, it's. Uh, Was it heavy? Oh, heavy crowd? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've had. Okay. Uh, no, because there are quite a lot of people who, who understand the issues. We just have a government and they made a whole paragraph on. Uh, what did they say? <laughs> we'll sit down and discuss uh, it. Yes, let, let's. Think, okay. All right. We stand very close to one another when it comes to, to, to how we see, in general, governments, I think, reacting to this crisis. And then we would like to see it differently. It's just, you know, don't you ever feel what I have when I, from the beginning, I said, I don't like the deal, but it's the best we can get under current circumstances, you know, in, in, in terms of reality. But now, 18 months later, it starts to, you know, for many reasons, be very difficult to stomach because we did not keep our promise of having the safe and legal routes from Turkey. You know, we are actually um, changing already no, the interpretation. We, I mean, we, we as need, Europe, I mean, yeah, you, no, we Europe as it, too, right? yeah, it has improved. The question is only what are the consequences if you have a deal like that with a country like Turkey? And we see that it's not safe. What can be the consequence if we depend so much on such a deal with such a country? What do we do? We stop sending people back? Well, the, the solution would have to be that we have credible guarantees. All the instruments we have, the European Court of Human Rights, it has a clear jurisdiction that applies to Turkey too, Article 3 on inhumane treatment. The alternative is we, I mean, basically, what would happen if you don't have the agreement now? No, I'm not, Everything's saying, I'm not worse. saying we should give up. No, but then... But, you know, what instruments do we have if we see that it's not safe enough? But we, know, we can't return people. And this is the direction I see. We'll start changing the legislation of the concept of thir safe third countries. And we will say you're inadmissible the moment you arrive in Europe because you're coming from a country where there's no, you know, no threat to your life. Uh, so we will not judge your application. This is what you see. That's in the already review. happened in Hungary. That's yes. already happened in all the Balkan yes, countries. It's true. But it happened the last but two years. But it's now going. You know, it's Dutch government who is behind this concept now. You know, we are now moving into a direction where it's not Viktor Orbán. We now have Western governments taking this concept. You, you know what? Fundamentally, it said we 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 want to control our borders without abolishing the right to asylum without treating people badly and without turning Europe into a fortress. It was not based on values. I, I, I it don't... was not. A lot of the critics, a lot of the human rights organizations, the NGOs, the refugee organizations are very, very right in their criticisms of what's going wrong. But what I fear is blanket criticism without trying to persuade people to do things. It might feel very good to lean back and say, Orban is awful, the Dutch government is awful, the German government is awful, uh, the far right is terrible, the mainstream parties are terrible too, the Greeks are not doing a good job. I mean, you, and then you sit back and say, actually, the world is a horrible place. But in this way, we don't improve conditions for anybody. What we need to be able to do is to go to Germany and say, look, this EU-Turkey agreement is actually in your interest. If you can bring people directly from Turkey, they will not get into boats and, and, and go to the Greek islands. Less people will drown. You will be able to preserve the refugee convention, which a lot of your voters might like because they actually have empathy. Okay, so... That's the sound of a dinghy, so it's a very high-pitched engine, and then a much lower roar, like a racing car. That's the smuggler boat. Is that pretty clear? Nice. Okay. If you put the top of your finger on the shore of Turkey, the bottom of your finger is approximately the border. So you have the Turkish Coast Guard on their side of the water patrolling and they're trying to stop dinghies, intercept them and then bring them back into Turkish waters. Obviously, if it's a smuggler boat just screaming in, you just say smuggler boat approaching 
zone too fast. That's all you have to say. So just use your common sense with this one a little bit. If it's a dinghy, then we can all like say it's a boat in distress, then obviously the bearing and range, it gives a pinpoint for them to come to. But if a boat sinks at nighttime, it's this team that sends out the rescue boat. So that's happened in recent weeks. Okay, finally, this is like a shadow lens for the sun. And then this is the, um, the focus. These people, when they're in their journey, they're on a very, very long journey. This is a tiny section of it, okay? But it's a particularly dangerous section of it. So we are here to ensure that this very dangerous section is made slightly safer so that people don't drown at sea. So everyone want to have a look at that and guess who that is? Oh, does anyone want to have a guess? Good? Yeah, which one? Greek or Turkish? Greek, perfect, very good. Can you see there's a blue stripe on the front of the boat? Every Greek Coast Guard boat has a blue stripe. The volunteers here are from everywhere. A lawyer, an ex-fireman, a environmental activist. They're all from a completely different background, but everyone gets on so well because they do have that same kind of understanding that people deserve the chance to be safe when they cross over. Just to have their case heard, their asylum case, that's it. I'm making a recipe with eggs, onion and parsley, which is, let's say, half Greek and uh, half uh, uh, Pakistani. <laughs> Many times we used to experience together by mixing our recipes and making a new thing. And uh, many times we give names also to these mixed uh, recipes. A part of the food is from the army and the part of the food, the biggest one, is from caterings that the government pays. Uh, it's not good. I wish the food to be good because it's the only thing that these people have now. If you have love for people, you can cook better. If somebody give you an egg to cook, if you do it with love, it's going to taste different. But if you want only to get the money, you just throw pasta in a big pot, boil, okay, put it in packages, boil some tomato, put it on top, give it, no. Food is not like this. Food is, uh, first of all, is love, and second is art. Because food is life. If you not, don't eat, you're gonna die. That means giving food is like giving life. Not very far, it's five kilometers, six kilometers more yeah, from our restaurant. Every time four people bring to a restaurant and go back later. So for me sometimes it's eight times, ten times to go to Moria or to Canada Bay and back. Look, people working everywhere. Sometimes working to our home from here, many times working.
something. It's better. It's better. No film. No film. No film. Εμεί σταματήσαμε τώρα έξω από τη Μόρια ε, και είδαμε κόσμο πολύ και αστυνομία. Στο μεταξύ είδα ένα μπιτσιρικά, είχε σφάξει το λαιμό του πριν αυτοκτονήσει με ένα μαχαίρι. Είναι ένα από το Αφγανιστάν, βγήκε από το αυτοκίνητο και πήγε και ρώτησα. Ναι, σώθηκε, αλλά τώρα. Όχι, και να μην πλέξουμε. Δεν αντιλάνε στο το Μόρια. Yes. Εγώ το μόλι αδιάπλωνας. Καλά. Τα λέμε. This to happen today many times per week. Many people they try to kill themselves. Yes, or uh, hunger strike sometimes or something else. Difficult, very bad. You know, here the people stuck for many, many months. Some people 14 months, some people 15, some people one year, 10 months stuck inside and uh, they want something to change for them because just waiting we uh, they can't do nothing just walking just looking just try to find hope spirit something something Making conditions on the islands unattractive and having the news going to Turkey and going to refugees that conditions are really bad might be part of the strategy. Now that is a very cynical game. What we ought to be aiming for is a fast and fair asylum procedure returning people who are safe in Turkey quicker and at the same time treating everyone uh, decently in line with human dignity and those who cannot be returned to Turkey, well, move them to the mainland within six weeks. The problem is that this is a European border. It's not just, and it shouldn't just be a Greek problem. So Greece needs solidarity. I think the solution is to make the European Union under Greek supervision responsible for EU reception centers where it is clear that the money that is available and there is no shortage of money is spent to create decent standard conditions like we find in reception centers in the Netherlands or in Germany and they should exist in Kios and Lesbos. And at the same time, the EU needs to focus all of its energy on how to make it possible that in the border states in the Mediterranean like Greece and Italy, we can have the Dutch system 
of a quality process with interviews and legal aid at every stage, leading to decisions within a few weeks. The lawyers told me getting family reunion maybe is so hard. And I was telling them that time, like, guys, I need to go very fast. If there is any chance just to go to for even for, I don't know, week, something like that to, and come back, please do it because I just need to be with my father. He's now in hospital and he's dying. And they was like, we can't do anything. This is the procedure. If you apply for any of these cases, you need to wait. We don't know, maybe three months, four months, six months, we don't know. And I was like, what I should do? I'm just stuck here. And even my father was telling my mother, like, I know Rami, he can't take care, care of himself. I know that, but he's so uh, emotional. And I'm afraid that um, that accident will affect him. And actually it was affect me and when he was Talking with me in that time, I used to tell him, like, Dad, I'm fine, don't worry. Don't worry, everything's fine. Even like if I'm, I was in the camp that time, I was telling him, like, Dad, I'm, I'm just imagine I'm in summer camp, don't worry. He was waiting for me and he just passed away. I couldn't be with him. When I get the news, I start crying. I start talking to myself. I lost my mind. I was like, why you didn't wait for me? I was coming for you. Why you didn't wait for me? So it was a crazy moment. I, it was crazy, actually. So if the procedure was more faster, I could be with him or something. And since that time, I have been be waiting here like 11 months. If we go back, not many, many years, in Greece there was a war. And Greek people living like uh, refugees in other countries. Now it's Syria and other countries. In the future might be England or Holland or Germany. You never know. So it's not their problem. We are in a planet. I mean, you might sound silly if you think that I am here and the problem is here, so I'm okay. No, it's not working like that. Well, of course, there is a problem. Here we have the refugee crisis. This is a problem, okay? But problems are here to be solved. It's not a solution to keep the refugees out of Europe or to move all the refugees in Turkey because nothing changed. Okay, they're not going to be uh, stuck in Greece in camps. They're going to be stuck in Turkey in camps or they're going to be sent it back to their countries where they came from because they had these big problems. So where is the solution? You need to build trenches. You need to push back. I hear it across Europe. We are currently in a situation where we are discussing in Europe to send people back without a procedure. This used to be a discourse of the far right a few years ago. It's now a discourse of perhaps the majority of governments in Europe. So the current European debate has reached a point where people say, let's just give up on the refugee convention because there's no way to make it work. This is incredibly dangerous. There was a time when uh, 
a huge number of Austrian Jews needed to leave Austria because their life was not safe. They knew there would be repression, they would lose their rights, they would be imprisoned, they'd be killed. And they tried to cross borders into Switzerland, for example. And at that time, we did not have a refugee convention. And a lot of them were pushed back. Uh, and I know that border very well, because that's the border between West Austria and Switzerland, where my mother grew up. And she was stateless. At exactly the time my mother was being smuggled into Switzerland, there was this meeting in Geneva, which decided that from now on, civilized countries in Europe would not push people back into danger. That the Refugee Convention was decided in 1951. To think that this is the legacy, well, I think it's, it should resonate for every European. If Europe moves out of uh, fear or indifference towards pushing people back, then the Refugee Convention is dead in the whole world. If the richest continent in the world cannot do it, why would other countries take seriously what was agreed in Europe in 1951? I think what is very important for voters is to push politicians. Yes, we want to control borders. We want less people to arrive irregularly. But we insist that there are some red lines which will not be crossed. And if voters articulate on this and are clear what the red lines are, no pushback of people without a procedure and no people drowning. We cannot accept 12,000 people drowning in the sea on the way to Europe in a few years. Those should be the red lines that politicians should swear to defend. Europe cannot give it up now when there are so many other ways to convince our publics that we can reduce irregular arrivals and yet allow people who need protection to come in. And the way to do that, that is the only fair and legal way, is by having fast procedures. Those who do need protection, after a few weeks they know it and they can stay in Europe, of course, and fully support it. Those who do not get protection should be returned to their countries of origin, their home country. And we need to offer the home country something. So we've been proposing safe and legal access for people from those countries, a certain contingent every year, so that in Nigeria or in Senegal, politicians can say, we are not contributing to building a fortress Europe, we actually create legal and safe access. And we need to combine this with increasing the resettlement of refugees directly from countries of origin or transit. So making an agreement with the state in Niger to put soldiers in the desert to chase refugees, that's not a good thing. Uh, and giving money to militias in Libya to keep boats from leaving and instead imprison people under terrible conditions, that's awful. I mean, this is both morally and politically a disaster. And I do not think it will lead to a stable policy. So we need to be very clear and distinguish between what kind of agreements we have. Hello, good to see you again. Hi. How are you? Good. Hello. 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 Hello, I'm Peter. Nice to meet you. The future of Europe as a moral community depends on finding this balance. Just two weeks ago, I get two job offers from companies, one from Austria, one from London. They told me like, we also we find you on in internet, we like your work, come to work with us. I just sent to them, apologize, like guys, I can't move now because I don't have travel document. I'm just keep waiting. What we can do right now? What can I help you here? Um, we're pretty much waiting for some clothes to be brought down. We're short on men's mm -hmm. t-shirts, small and medium, and just basically now getting the camp prepared. 
if stage one is used for refugees mm -hmm. on the next landing, which is looking highly likely. Every time we, when we have a landing, boat arrive, I go with the NGOs and start helping transit uh, between uh, the volunteer and the refugees, between the police and the refugees, and even more like try to make the people calm down because when the people arrive here, they are so scared. They don't know what the next step, what will happen to them. We take them here from the beach to, to, camp, to camp here, like temporary camp stage two. We give them uh, food and cloth. I hope we don't have another landing to a big crisis now. We have a landing uh, yesterday and there was like uh, 55 person. And, the, and also there was another landing in the south in Mytilene city. Oh really? I didn't know that. The point is uh, they, they don't have enough place on uh, Moria in the main camp in Mytilene. Yeah. If you have many landings, it will be really crisis again here in the island. Big problem. Yeah, big problem it will be. Amani, I'm looking for you. How many people who can? We have here uh, me at uh, okay. okay. People waiting out of Moria. Okay. No so problem. we go together because she knows them, okay. and yeah. you can take them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One. One guy from Afghanistan. He tried to kill. Self. Many police are there, ambulance go, and uh, I'm just waiting to see for your friends, but these guys, yeah. I saw them before. Eh? Yeah, poor guys. Yes. I saw, I saw you before, but the other car, okay? Yes, I are a You can't help all the people, but if you can help one, help him. Maybe I can help one, but Europe for sure can help thousands. incredibly positive story. An outpouring of volunteer support and sympathy and activism. People opening their doors, people volunteering to help. Publics have shown that people don't just watch television or press the like button on Facebook, but become active. This is an energy that is real. This isn't a policy, so we still need a national policy. But this is a basis of empathy on which you can build a humane policy. What is your name? Junaid. Junaid. If European community cannot take 500,000 people and split them in their rich countries, giving them a normal life, then Europe is nothing. Where is the power of Europe? Europe is capable if it wants to. Greece and the EU can do something. You can do something.
Um, just for the people who came after uh, Movie Was Started, I'm your moderator, I'm your host, and uh, I will have four guests in, uh, in a few seconds here, and I will have a conversation with them for about 30 minutes, and after that conversation, I hope that you can ask them some questions. The conversation will be about two things, about their link to the uh, EU-Turkey uh, deal, and moreover, especially about what they do or maybe what we can do over there. So that will be the, the aim of the conversation. And if everything goes according to the plan, we will be finished here at seven o'clock, inshallah. And then, uh, then you go really talk with each other about your own uh, initiatives, your own actions. And having said that, I have the honor to ask one of the main characters of the documentary, Rami, to join me. Rami, would you please come here? Yeah, Rami. This is yours, please. Sit over there. Okay, I'm going to sit over there because uh, uh, after 10 minutes, you will have two more people over there. Rami, first of all, uh, welcome in Holland. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm so happy to be here and meet you here. Thanks for everyone for coming today. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Nice Rami, just for, to refresh uh, our memory, you're from Syria. Which part of Syria are you from? Uh, I'm from Syria, I'm from Damascus, uh -huh. but I used to live in the south uh, suburbs of uh, Damascus. I see, yeah. And this sub south suburbs right now is surrounding, no one go in, no one go out. Yeah, and um, when did you arrive in, in Turkey, uh, in, um, in Greece? I arrived in Greece in um, July, July 13, 2016. 2016 yes. After two days that rebel or the revolution happened in, in uh, Turkey, if you remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just arrived after two days that happened there. Okay. Why are you telling me that? Now I'm getting scared. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember that days yeah. my friends called me. They said, like, um, the situation is going crazy here in Turkey. There was, like, tanks there. And actually, in that time, if you are in Turkey, you will feel the stress among the Turkish people because, like, there was explosion all the time there. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, that would be one of the questions, especially I will ask the lawyer who will join us later, whether the situation in Turkey is uh, safe enough for refugees in, in general, you know. So having said that, so you, uh, June 2016, you arrived there, and um, now you have a legal uh, statute. You, uh, you, can, you can stay legally? Uh, yes, like uh, after happened? that. Actually, what's happening when... Uh, I was going for family, family reunification, as I was mentioning in the movie, that because my father was dying there in Germany. But after, it's take like three months, after three months they tell me like, uh, well, congratulations, you get uh, the status as a refugee in Greece. I was like, I didn't ask for that. I asked for family reunification. They say, well, you didn't say it clearly. I was like, what do you mean clearly? Like. Uh, telling you my father dying there and do you need all the, uh, all the papers that, uh, as evidence like my family yeah. there. I give you all the, every things. What you say, I didn't say it clearly. Yeah. They say, well, that's what's happened. Do you want to cancel it now? I say like, well, after three months, uh, you want me to cancel waiting in this bad uh, yeah. situation? Yeah. Okay, what can I do? You just yeah. put me in this situation. So yeah. after that, it's take me like... Um, six months to get the ID of the um, residence. It's yeah. three years in, um, 
uh, in Greece, and after and it's take like ages to get the travel documents. I just get it maybe like one month ago. My God. So yeah. when I get it, now I could uh, leave uh, and came here. And you can travel all over Europe. I can go. Um, when you get the residence there, you, you also you get the, the rights, the same as uh, Greek people, mm -hmm. not citizenship, just the rights. Yeah. Uh, so I can go out from Greece like um, three three months. I see. I see. So that's the, so uh, now it's you are in Holland. I would like to uh, know uh, from you. Um, the the picture we saw the the, the documentary we saw um, which part was for you as someone who has seen it all happening which one was for you the most important one uh, which subject or which scene you mean in the whole movie yeah yeah maybe two subjects or two scenes which were you know for you most striking more uh, actually, one. about like talking about the Turkish uh, deal and about like how it should be. Yeah. But actually, um, you don't see anything happening on the ground right now. Like they say, like they create this Turkish deal, uh, and uh, uh, they was expecting like um, the uh, the European country will take actions or they do th anything to help the people out. Um, but it's not, there is nothing going on there. You go to, the, to Greece, you will feel, they will find the people, they are just stuck there. There are many cases, and as you see in the movie, the people, they are so desperate. Some of them, they try to kill themselves. Uh, they are so desperate. Uh, when I was there, actually, uh, I was, as you see, I was volunteering. Yeah. And later... Uh, for, for whom you were volunteering? I was volunteering uh, with... Uh, with NGO called the Waha, I was helping the doctors and the nurses. We go to the landing when this boat arrive. Yeah. They need the uh, doctors, so I go on to translate between the doctor and the patient. I see. And later, I start working with NGO called Caritas. So uh, after that, I I witnessed once I was going out from the work and the nurse was running. She said, "Rami, someone trying to kill himself." I was me and her alone. Uh, I didn't find, I never uh, faced a situation like this. I ran back to the guy, tried to convince him to go to the hospital. We was alone, be, me and her. And the nurse told me like, don't freak out his family, they don't know. He drank something, like uh, cleaning something uh, yeah, yeah. for clean. Yeah. After, after five minutes, I, man I managed to convince him to go to the hospital. The guy was so desperate. Just like uh, one hour ago, I was talking with him, he was looked normal. I I couldn't I can't forget that um, that day because it was so stressed like you, like uh, you, you can't imagine like someone will try to kill himself that, like that because and then you desperate. have to and then you have to help you need to help and you need to you, you can't just standing and do nothing okay Rami my final question for you would be what do you think about the fact that um, NGOs or ordinary people or people like you you know just other refugees have uh, taking up that uh, job to help other people. It's not really their job, in a way. You know? Well, you are actually, not a specialized doctor. And I understand, but like in some situation, like uh, when uh, when I was uh, say in the camp, um, many times uh, the NGO asked for my help uh, from the UN, from. Uh, from uh, others, like even the security, even anyone, they need to ask my help, let's yeah. say, for simple things as for translation. Yeah. So I would be like sleeping and they would come and woke me up at three in the morning, they say there's a problem, come and help us. So you find yourself like you need to help the people, if you don't help them, who will help them? That's so right. you, can't, you can't step aside and do nothing. If you can't help, you, you, you will help. Yeah. And trust me, like, uh, how can I say, it doesn't take so much effort from you to do something good for others. Yeah. You can do it and you will, uh, how can I say, I don't know, you don't need even to think about it. You will feel yourself, you are just acting. Let me just, this final note about that, you know, but in that way, you know, uh, when the NGOs are doing that job, um, the government, you know, the officials, the authorities, they will not do that job again because there are some other people who in their job. Well, actually, the situation there is so crazy in Greece. Like, um, most of the jobs is going on, or I mean, like, uh, the people who's taking care of uh, the refugees there, most of them, they are like private NGOs. Yeah. 
uh, over there, like uh, when you hear like um, uh, support from government or something, you don't see it in the ground. All the things happening by the NGOs, private NGOs. Like, yeah. um, how can I say, there is many of, of them. You have, for example, NGO uh, called Movement on the Ground. I meet them on, uh, on Karatebe. As a matter of fact, we got someone for a Movement on the Ground. Yes, yeah. and there is my friend uh, Claudia, uh, yeah. she's from uh, Movement on the Ground. <laughs> oh, okay. so she's shall, shall we ask them to, come to join us here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Please. Uh, okay. Claudia de Barros uh, from Movement on the Ground and Anja Holverda. And she's with um, Stichting Bootvluchteling. Those are your microphones. Yeah? Yes. I'm going to sit in the middle. Hi. And pak een uh, microfoon. Even kijken. Um, Claudia, alsjeblieft. Uh, for you. And this one is for you. Okay. Um, Anja. Did it work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me start with you. Uh, you are with uh, Stichting Bootvluchteling. Yes. What do we do there? Wat is de Stichting Bootvluchteling? Uh, Stichting Bootvluchteling, Boat Refugee Foundation, has a mission on Lesbos, uh, providing psychosocial support, education, psychosocial activities, and a healthcare mission. Oké, okay. and uh, you are with them since 2016, am I right? Ja, yeah. yeah. I have been joining have them yeah. as a medical coordinator from uh, November 16 till June 17, and again last fall i was i've been there for two months yeah and, and nowadays you are managing their social channels uh, of uh, movement uh, or no the boat flying now you are still <laughs> that's, me. Uh, uh, yeah, that's you yeah 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 <laughs> so what's your job on let's say daily basis what do you do on daily basis well i'm still a nurse and yeah. um trying to um prolong my career in humanitarian aid okay because that's your background yeah mm, yeah, yeah nursing uh, yes so Verpleegkundige. Yeah, nurse, yeah. And um, Claudia, for you, uh, you are with uh, Movement on the Ground. Yeah, that's correct. And what's that, Movement on the Ground? Movement on the Ground is, as you can see, this is our work. Yeah. Um, we're an organization who started actually in 2016. Yeah. Um, initiated by the photo of the guy or the little boy named Aylan. Yeah who came up to Turkish shore, and after that, a few of our initiators went to Lesbos yeah. and started an NGO. Yeah. Um, what we do, we do various things. We do a solar panel project, so we have solar panels installed in one of the camps. Great. We do a football program, we do activities, we have barber shops. we actually fill up all the gaps yeah. where we and can fill it up. That's the, 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 the stichting with Johnny de Mol, am I right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. one of our founders. One yeah. of our founders, yeah. yeah. Okay, and um, what do you do there? What What's did your I do? job? I started as a volunteer, actually, for one week. I just decided to Why? take matters into own hand. And Why? Went there. Why? Well, I had a lot of opinions about what I was seeing, especially what I was seeing in the news and all the images, and I was very opinionated. Like, I had all kind of discussions and then I thought okay if I have like an opinion I should do something with it so I just it signed up in a blank moment and just went and I was so struck by what I saw it was in April no June 2016 I came back and I was totally confused like wow. what's happening and yeah. how can it happen within the European borders of one of the richest yeah um Continents. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask you both of you. There's a question for both of you, for Anja and, and Claudia. What's the impact of the EU-Turkey deal as far as you can see it? Maybe on a micro level, as you can see it, or a meso level, or maybe macro uh, macro level. How do you see the, the, the impact of this uh, deal? Well, what I can see is that it totally disrupted an island. Um, In which way, please? in a way that, uh, as Gerard, uh, Gerald Knaus already said, uh -huh. that it was a holiday island, uh, a beautiful island, which has no capability of providing care uh, and refuge uh, to refugees uh, with uh, highly specialized needs, uh, because as you already said, and what we have seen every day on a daily basis, people are going mental, um, means that they, there is a serious threat of um, mental this uh, mental stress yeah. distress yeah. yeah and and how do you see uh, the, this uh, EU deal the impact of EU deal well my first time there was after the EU Turkey deal so I can't judge from before but I know the floods were a lot more at the time before the EU Turkey deal after that it 
took down, but there were a couple of things happening at the same time, I think. Also, the Balkan route got stopped, so it got closed, and those things together made people, actually, they're stuck on the islands now. Beforehand, they could just move on and just go to the country of their, where the family was or whatever, and now people are stuck in desperation. So that's the main thing, I think. As you put it, it doesn't sound, in general, totally, you know, it doesn't sound very good. Am I right? The, the situation? Impact? No, in Greece is not that good. No. no. Huh. no. You, you, are you agree with that? You know, the, that the impact is not good at the end of the day? No, the impact's horrible. But that's uh, acknowledged, luckily. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm very glad that there is a new movement uh, that acknowledges the failure of the Turkey deal and that we have to start thinking about another solution. Yeah. 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 Um, um, by the way, you just mentioned something about what the EU deal did with the, with the local, um, let's say, atmosphere, with the local issues over there. And thank God we have Ingeborg Beugel, who is uh, one of the, yeah, the few journalists in, in Holland who has been reporting about uh, Greece for several years. She's among us. Ingeborg, can I ask you just a short question about... The, because we're talking a lot about the refugees, the, 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 the impact of this on refugees and other people in Turkey. But can you take us to the local situation, as you can see it? Can you elaborate about that, the impact of the EU deal for, for uh, Greek uh, people? I should just come to you with a, a mic. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please stand up. Maybe you can join us here in the spotlight. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say something uh, about the Turkey deal. Everybody mm. says, even you, yeah. that after the Turkey deal that was implemented the 18th of March, two years ago, um, it worked in the sense that the numbers of refugees came down. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the Turkey deal. Okay. It has to do with the closing of the borders of Macedonia, of Serbia. Okay. Uh, the refugees, uh, how many were there? Uh, 22,000 in the yeah. winter of 2016, 2017. They were stranded in the mud. Women given birth in snow and rain. Um, it was an unbearable situation. And what do refugees do? Yeah, they have smartphones. Please don't tell me that because they are smartphones, they're not poor enough to fly. They have smartphones and they WhatsApp each other. Don't come to Greece. Yeah. Because if you come here, you are fucked like rats trapped in horrible horror camps, whether on the islands yeah. or in the mud at Idomeni. Yeah. So, the politicians from the EU and the Netherlands, like Timmermans and others who say, even Knaus, the Turkey deal works, works. because look, yeah. the numbers went down. Yeah. No, yeah. it's because the borders were closed yeah. and the refugees got trapped yeah. and Turkey is doing very little okay. to keep the refugees there and is not like showing a lot of action to push boats back or whatever. So no. This now is, I'm touching you, Ingeborg. I'm you know, I, I, want, about this. Yeah, <laughs> I want to interrupt. You know? As I said, you know, my question was about you know, the impact of EU deal for the local people, maybe on the islands, or maybe in general for, 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 uh, for uh, Greece. Can you tell us something? It has nothing to do with the impact of the, no? of the EU deal. No? No. It has to do with the impact of the arrival of the refugees. Yeah. Greece, like Italy, happen, both of them, to be the borders the border. of the EU. Yeah. So how the fuck can you punish yeah. a country for having the borders yeah. of the EU, which is exactly what the EU is doing? I want to make something very clear. Shame on EU, but that means shame on EU politics. Because, like you guys have seen, I have met since 2015, when the tsunami of refugees started, I mean, one million refugees went through Greece. Can you imagine? 800,000 through Lesbos, which is not completely a holiday island. Thank God there's like 60% agriculture. But that island is fucked, right? And it's not re-emerging. By the way, I can all advise you to go there because there is no island better to go for a holiday than Lesbos because it's <laughs> empty. It's the most paradisian <laughs> holiday resort. If you're smart, you go there. Um, yeah, what was the fact? So, the, the, best, 
the EU deal, nothing to do. You think w okay. what the impact is of the EU yeah. on Greece? Come and have a look. Okay. I mean, the Turkey deal is just one thing. Okay. Let's talk about the Troika, okay. which I won't do. Okay. The other <laughs> thing I want to say is, and this is very important, please give Maybe me two final. minutes. Two yeah. minutes, okay, your two minutes is going now. Yes, please, two minutes, yeah. The NGOs. In 2015, there was an explosion of spontaneously set up NGOs by all these volunteers that came from Europe. Switzerland, Germany, uh, Holland, Belgium. The nicest Europeans right now are in Greece. All the fuckers stayed behind. But the nicest people are there doing volunteer work. And all these NGOs, because of the chaos, could kind of work. What happened then? Then there was like 800 so much million thrown at Greece. But because the EU does not trust Greece, that money for 70% went to the UNHCR. The UNHCR is the coordinator, all right? So, until last August 2017, the UNHCR was the contractor. The UNHCR with subcontracts and the hotspots, not like Karatepe. I mean, you have to understand Karatepe, which is paradise of camps, is the only hotspot camp, not really official hotspot, that functions without the system, with the local mayor and with the NGOs and has nothing to do with the abject EU system, okay? Yeah, it's an example. Up? Yes, they said the time is up. No, but I'm not finished. No, no but I you need... said two minutes. Yeah. Do no, you want to hear the rest? No, 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 no. I don't know. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. You want to hear the rest or not? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, finish Sorry. up, please. <laughs> okay, so UNHCR subcontracted NGOs. These NGOs were spontaneously organized. There were Greek volunteers, European volunteers, and they came without being paid. Then they got into an NGO, and then UNHCR people who did work for 2,500 a month euros subcontracted NGOs with volunteers who did work for the same work for 800 euros a month. And then the overkoepelende organisatie van langdurig werklozen in Griekenland. Yeah. The uh, over, uh, uh, overall, uh, overall uh, umbrella organisation. Uh, umbrella Greek organisation for long-term unemployed Greeks because of the crisis. Protested. And they went to Premier Tsipras and said, hey... All these foreigners from NGOs, they are subcontracted by UNHCR and they have little jobs with refugees for 800 euros. What about us? And you know what happened? Since the end of July last year, all the NGOs are out. They cannot work anymore for the UNHCR. The long-term Greek unemployed, who are the most illiterate, they don't speak English, they don't le read Latin, they don't have a heart for the refugees, they are put in there and they do the same job for 450 euros. And I know all these NGO volunteers who had to go out of the hotspots crying and the Greeks who went in there like, I'm going to do a shitty job and I spit on these people and they got 800 and I get 450 and I have to do this work. They're there. They don't hug the refugees. They don't sing with them. They don't give them English lessons. When they want more water, they don't get it. When they need more diapers, they don't get it. I'm sorry, I'm crying about this. But you guys have no idea what's going on in Greece. And the NGOs and the volunteers that are doing the job that Europe and you, the Turkey deal should have freed them from, they can't even move anymore, okay? Even the NGOs that want to give refugees food, because food is love. And I have seen with my own eyes how NGOs illegally put 2,500 meals in Tupperware for some Islam fiesta and gave it through a hole in the back of a camp so the soldiers, because the hotspots are guarded by the Greek army, could not see it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingeborg. Thank you very much. Um, as a matter of fact, you, in a way, you answered the question you know, about the impact on Greece. So, 
<laughs> in a strange way, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I, you know, the, the same way, you know, we have, yeah, 35 minutes. Um, zoom out a little bit. Uh, um, that's why I'm uh, asking uh, Philip Schuler, lawyer, to join me here. Philip, would you please, um, please, that's, uh, sit over there. And you got your own microphone over there? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Philip Schuler. Yeah. And you are a um, um, migration and asylum lawyer specialized in international uh, litigation. And, um, and you have been to Lesbo, uh, Lesbos yourself, am I right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I was uh, when? there um, 2015 or 16, I'm not quite sure. I was there on behalf of the European Association of Lawyers, which yeah. is a group of lawyers, of a million lawyers. And uh, what struck us before that on Lesbos there were uh, doctors there, there were nurses there, there were lifeguards there, but there were no lawyers there. And surely as one of the richest organizations, we thought that lawyers should also be there. Yeah. Particularly because the, the laws in Greece at that time prior to the deal were changing all the time. Yeah. So you can blame the guy, the guard, yeah. At, the, at, the, at the station and the policeman, but every day he had a different kind of law. Yeah. So he didn't know what to do. So our first job was to seek and give reliable information. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I went there. Yeah. By the way, what do you think about the deal? Because in a way, I don't know how to put it. It sounds like it's a, like a trade, you know? We give them some money, you know? Turkey and they are taking some refugees, you know, it's, it's like, you know, in a way like a human trait. What do you think about the, the, the essence of this, you know, the, the very fundament of this uh, deal? Well, I mean, I agree with you. That's one way of looking at it. It's a very good deal for Erdogan <laughs> because there's very little people actually being taken from Turkey to the EU. Yeah. He's getting a hell of a lot of money. And he makes sure in that way that any internal criticisms towards whatever he's doing in his own country is, 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 is blanketed away because yeah. the EU does not want to be too critical. I was in Turkey three, four times over the last two, three years as an asylum expert. And I spoke to uh, Turkish academics who are even afraid to speak out post the coup on what's happening there. Yeah. And... Um, because of the coup, you must understand that the emergency law is in place, and because the emergency law is in place, the whole Turkish, the little safeguards that there were in Turkish law have completely been demolished. Okay. So you send anybody back, it's a lottery ticket. They might be treated well, they might be treated terribly, <laughs> they might be sent away, they might be killed by border guards. It's, it, it is not safe. Okay, I have just more two questions for you, and afterwards, uh, me and um, uh, Ida, my colleague, uh, Ida, will just uh, come to you with a microphone, and she will hold the microphone on uh, her own hand, because otherwise, you will all be Ingeborg. So, to uh, avoid that situation, question, I mean, Ingeborg, I, don't get me wrong, I liked it, you know, I really love your contribution. Um, uh, this question, you just mentioned, it. in your opinion, at the end of the day, is the deal is, um, gives enough legal protection for refugees when you are back in Turkey? That's not even, for me, that's a, a oh, no-brainer. No-brainer. No. Everybody knows that. I mean, it's clear. All the information is clear. The question is not yeah. whether the situation is safe. The yeah. question is not whether it's documented. Yeah. The real issue in Brussels is, do you want to see what's happening or do you want to close your eyes? Wow. And that's a question of political encouragement or courage to yeah. say this is unacceptable. Yeah. And then you've got to think of alternatives, and there are alternatives. Yeah. Uh, and the final question would be, since the deal is like a fact, mm -hmm. um, do you see any possibilities? And that's a question for you too, for maybe you can think about it. Do you see any possibilities to a little bit adjust the deal, modify the, bill, the deal? The deal is not a fact, A, because we're still litigating against it. Okay. B, the deal is fundamentally flawed yeah. uh, because the, 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 the legal assumptions on which it's based are not there. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, another aspect which I think somebody mentioned, but which I think is very important, is that because of the deal, this, the dire situation all the way in the route, all the way to up to Austria, is even worse. Now, there's still, I go to the Balkans three, four times a year to work and study there and teach yeah. uh, border guards, lawyers, and so forth. The only difference is that the travel is slower, the amount of money that the people smugglers are, pay, are being paid is larger, but there's still the trickle-down situation. So don't think that it's actually being stopped, it's just being slowed down. I see. So now countries like Albania come into place, and yeah. believe me, you don't want to be dependent on the Albanian mafia. No. I mean. no. Do you want to add something, Alicia? Yeah, you mentioned like changing minor things about yeah. a deal. It's not yeah. about changing things about a deal or making a different deal. It's about who will take ownership for it and who will implement it. Because yeah. I think last year there was a lack, a big lack of leadership and of a political will. Yeah. Um, so these are, beside a good deal, the most important things to change. Yeah. Yes. If there's yeah. change. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Ida, uh, I'm giving you uh, my microphone, and as as I said, don't give it away. <laughs> um, do you have to stand up or? Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank you for making this documentary, um, and I think it would be very valuable to also showed this on the, the Dutch national television to make clear to um, the Dutch people. Will be. Yeah? <laughs> Perfect. Well, <laughs> that, that's, that's very well. Um, well, I was wondering, um, talking about law, um, when there was in 2017, well, half a year ago, there was a suit against uh, the Dutch state um, that was about can the Dutch state um, be... Um, in a way, held for um, taking refugees from the camps to to the Netherlands, and um, they lost the Sioux. The All right. Well, that's that's an interesting fact. Um, and I was wondering, when you go to an international level, uh, what possibility is there to go to the international court in the Hague and to sue, for example, Turkey or maybe Europe? Uh, for a possibility to take care of the refugees and to make clear that we as, as, as people from the Netherlands have a responsibility in order to get refugees from there to here. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I actually represent 11 Syrians at the European Court who are direct victims of uh, the EU-Turkey deal who were taken to Turkey without any form of procedure in Greece, because in Greece, you must understand, the administration is so terrible that by mistake, suddenly, you might end up one day in Turkey while actually you were going to, uh, to Athens. And they said, oops, sorry. Mm. Uh, that is the level of organization that Turkey is at, or Greece is at. Uh, a second thing is there are still ca court cases going on. Three court cases are, are going on. One is on the EU-Turkey deal. Uh, proper on the principle of it, which is in higher appeal now in the in the Luxembourg Court of the EU, where it should be because it's an EU problem, it's not a Council of Europe problem. And third, there are many procedures still going on. One of the problems for EU politicians, if you want to call it that, is that very little people are actually being sent back to Turkey. Now, why is that? Because quite a few judges and commissions think that it's not safe. Now, European politicians feel, on the one hand, they adhere to the rule of law, but only if it suits them. So the whole Greek law system was changed because it was going too slow. Okay, good. And I'm going to the, to the lawyer. To see whether... Okay. Right, sure, sure. My name is Gert-Jan van den Berg. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Gert-Jan van den Berg. Uh, Ingeborg, uh, thank you for using uh, the fuck word. Uh, God bless you, because uh, I feel less ashamed now for doing the same. Um, we um, sued the Dutch state uh, for not adhering uh, to uh, two uh, directives um, uh, on the European uh, level. In um, September 2015, 
uh, in Brussels, there was an agreement uh, that uh, we would uh, divide 160,000 um, refugees amongst uh, European countries. Um, and uh, very little of that was accomplished. In Brussels, um, uh, they like to think uh, that uh, Europe is a community of values, but when it comes to um, um, uh, refugees, um, uh, Brussels should be uh, uh, freakingly ashamed. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, watching the documentary was um, uh, Mr. Knaus sitting behind his desk with a huge stack of paperwork. Uh, in Brussels, they're very good at creating enormous stacks of paperwork. Uh, uh, and at that point, I was uh, thinking, hey, stand the fuck up, do something. Uh, because uh, what we're facing right now is that the EU-Turkey deal has led to a lot of paperwork, uh, but still tens of thousands of refugees are stuck in Greece. Um, I visited uh, one together with Ingeborg in uh, Athens, uh, and uh, these camps are being surrounded by traffickers. And these traffickers have contact with the refugees, and they tell them, listen, uh, a fake passport will cost you 4,000 euro. And if you don't have the money, then please send your children to the Victoria Park in Athens, where they can prostitute themselves. Which is, happening. Which is ha still happening in Athens. Um, we sued the Dutch state for not adhering uh, to the uh, redivision of, uh, the, um, uh, of the number of refugees um, uh, that was agreed to in September 2015. And what's the actual situation with this uh, uh, these, uh, law, we, law case? We, as, uh, we lost both instances at uh, the um, uh, district court and at the court of appeals in uh, The Hague. So it's finished? Um, or are you... No, no, no. Uh, well, 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 yes, well, okay. the, the, the main argument um, uh, was um, uh, that the uh, European Commission uh, has complemented the Netherlands with the good work. Um, and um, the figures that were absolute figures, the numbers of refugees that had to be taken into the Netherlands were absolute figures, all of a sudden. 9,000 yeah. Yes. All of a sudden were relative figures. Um, and uh, the, the judges said, well, listen, uh, we're looking at uh, the reports of uh, the European Commission complementing the Netherlands with what it does. So who are we to judge the Dutch state for not doing enough? Um, and the Dutch state argued these figures aren't absolute figures. These are relative figures. And given the fact that countries like Poland and Hungary don't do shit, uh, we are in a position to state that we do enough. Okay. What we heard is... Uh, What's one, the one more thing. One more, no, I'm, I'm doing a, a little Ingeborg here. Um, <laughs> you set a good example, Ingeborg. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Go on, go on. <laughs> um, what we found out afterwards is um, uh, that whenever the European Commission comes out with a, a quarterly report, it uh, sends a draft to The Hague. And then the whole manipulation game starts. Uh, the Hague manipulates the European Commission in such a way uh, that we're still getting compliments for what we're doing, whereas we're doing shit. What we do is not in conformity um, uh, with the EU directive what that was given by the Council in September 2015. Nothing. But given the fact that um, the European Commission gives these reports in which countries like the Netherlands that doing is the absolute bare minimum yeah. are given compliments yeah. um, for that um, the, the judges said well listen we're in no position uh, to, um, uh, to, to state that uh, the country uh, that okay. the Netherlands should do more my question I have a question to the, um, the um, lawyer present no, we you are said, not doing the lawyer asking other lawyers questions. No, <laughs> we have three people over here, you know, asking a uh, question. Well, if, yeah. they, if they can uh, answer the, que the question that I yeah. have, uh, yeah. uh, 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 mention was made that there were alternatives. Yeah. 
I, I would very much like to hear what these alternatives uh, yeah. uh, uh, are, Good. because uh, that's an important question. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. So, the alternatives, yes. <laughs> Um, one of the things that struck me during the documentary was that the mention of work. Yeah. He said, I got two job offers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, as a refugee lawyer, I find astounding is that we don't look at them as refugees as individuals who are adults who make decisions for their families and for work. If they can work, then why are they stuck in camps? We've got very good temping organizations in the Netherlands called Uitzendbureaus. We have a large amount of workforce which is needed. You know, the Germans can do it, the Dutch can do it, everybody can do it. And we're talking about welders, nurses, and so forth. Now, why are all these people sitting there idly in these camps while there's work to be done in the north? Why don't we just like get the temping agents to go through all of these camps, take the people who can work, who are strong enough to work, and make sure and are strong enough to work and to support themselves, and leave it up to the state to take care of the weaker ones who can't take care of themselves. That's how we normally organize society. So why should refugees be excluded from yeah. this general notion, which yeah. I don't think is very strange. Yeah. It's good for the people. Okay. The receiving countries, and it's good for the refugees. May I hear your uh, take on this uh, this idea? It sounds very, you know, well thought, very simple, and very uh, good. Yes, uh, the point is like uh, not all the refugees inside the camps they can work uh, in legal way. Uh, you need like to get like the tax number, the, all these insurance things, and to get this step, it's, it's take you months to get this step. Yeah. So, so if you can't get this tax number, all these things, you need to stuck in the camps. Yeah. Without, without working. But how about if you could go to the north of Europe directly? Yeah. You mean so like... Uh, not work in Greece, but work in Sweden, Germany, Holland, directly. Why yeah, not? I mean, you're stuck there for months. Yeah, that's what I... Uh, okay, maybe I misunderstand what you are saying. But yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, if that's possible, that would be amazing. If you can't take the people immediately to go and work there. Yeah. If you don't do it for the refugees, do it for your own economy. Uh, how about you, Anya? Exactly. Yeah, you said something about leaving the vulnerables behind then? No, what I'm saying is that the vulnerables should be more eligible for government support. So illiterate women who've got problems with children, psychological pro I mean, I represent a lot of traumatized clients. Yeah. They're no fit state to work. Yeah. Well, obviously they okay. need care, well, but well, the people who you... are able to do yeah. Uh, to, to to take care of themselves. Yeah. Why don't you at least yeah. allow them to do yeah. so? Why did you Why did you ask this question? As a matter of fact, well, what's your concern? Uh, what you see on Lesbos in in Greece that the level of skills needed to uh, give care to the vulnerables uh, it's not present in Greece. Yes. Uh, it's so specific that you say the state needs to take care of them. Oh. They are not able. No, okay. I mean they absolutely are not agree. Able to okay. Do it. I understand. Uh, may I have, you know, we just saw two, uh, two NGOs. May I have uh, uh, Adrian Kokan, he's with the uh, organization Home for a Day. It's an uh, amazing uh, initiative. Adrian, would you please join us here? Adrian Kok, okay, come on, yeah. Thank you for introducing my surname so correct, Cook. I usually introduce myself as Cook because, oh, you know, yes. yeah. Why? obvious reasons, right? Okay. Thank you. Um, Adrian, okay. please tell us yes. something about your, um, your uh, toko. Well, um, um, I'm here now Let's standing see. on behalf of Nikos and Katarina, of the organization Home. Yeah. And uh, so it's a bit disappointing that you're seeing him here on stage, yeah. because uh, Nikos uh, was uh, promised, he promised to be here, or at least he was planning to be here, but he couldn't make it. So yeah. he called me a few days ago and asked me if I would be so kind to represent him, which of course I said yes. Um, so what's this, Home for a Day? Home for a Day, well, we saw it in the documentary. Uh, what can I say more? You saw it for, for yourself. Home for a Day is an organization which has been started by Nikos and Katarina in 2015. At the day the first refugee came on Lesbos, they noticed 
the need to help. And um, they used to have this restaurant filled up with tourists, making money, not a lot, you know, but they had making enough to, to have a living. Um, now, Greek is a strange country on some issues. We heard already tonight some comment on that. And um, the authorities in Greek, they uh, stood up and they came to Nikos and Katrina and said, listen, what you're doing here, we don't like that. So totally un 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 understandable. Um, but the, the, the message was very clear. They told him, listen, you have to make a choice. You have this restaurant and we just forbid you to have any more refugees coming in and giving them this night, in this afternoon, yeah. a moment of love, a moment of dignity. Yeah. So they had to make a choice. Will we continue what we are doing for refugees and give up our security? And if you realize what it means, I mean, here in the Netherlands, you know, we have social security. In Greece, forget about it. They give up everything they have yeah. only to help. For me, they're heroes. If you look at the whole issue, and I will listen tonight, I think and you look at like, the refugee uh, crisis, I see when it comes to aid and helping or not helping and making decisions, I think you have three levels, right? You have one, you have got the abstract level where the governments are looking at it. Then we got this second level, the level NGOs. Some of those guys from the NGOs are working behind their desks, some are in the camps, organizing, giving, giving a hand. And then you got the third level, and that are the NGOs and people like Nikos and Katarina, yeah. really, really with their feet in, on the ground, yeah. in the mud, they're doing yeah. it. Yeah. And this third level, they are the bravest people. Um, we have some pictures over here, and when I came down, uh, when, I, when, I, when I said, Nikos, okay, I will go down here, he told me, Adrian, Adrian, you don't need to talk about home. Tell the people in the Netherlands that there are many Greek that care. There are many Greek that are helping. And um, you don't need to talk about us, talk about the others. And the point is that if we talk about Greece, we feel very often quite negative about the whole situation and blaming Greece about it. But there are so many Greeks that do care. Um, for instance, when I first got introduced in Lesbos by another organization, because we carry, um, to the manager of that camp, Mr. Colt Stavros. He's a kind of military guy. He's an alpha man, you know, you know him. I see here nodding, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's, you know, he wants to look good, he does. Yeah. And uh, you, you just, you don't walk around this guy. So he, he letting us wait there for three days and, and we actually, we, we didn't came here because of home. We came there because we had another ID which is called Connect by Music and we are, uh, we were providing uh, music schools and music program on nine locations by now. But Cartepe actually was the first camp we could start with the support of Steffi and so we were introduced to Stavos and he was uh, standing there after three days looking at us and not giving any attention and then he suddenly came to us and said, hey I like your karma. You know, this military guy. Yeah. I like your karma. What's up, you know? Yeah. And then uh, he said, oh, come down to my office tomorrow. We'll discuss your program. And then he turned around and there was a lady standing there. And it was clear that she had a previous life. She, she, you see, you know, she was well off. She was, you could see it by her clothes, although they were filthy. But you could recognize it. But her face was full of fear. And next to her was standing a translator. And he was, he was standing to the translator like this. Tell her I am her brother. You know, like that. So this guy was around. Yeah, she, she, okay. Tell her she's my sister. Make her understand I will protect her with my life. And this is one... Actually, he was one of my first Greek heroes, which I met. After that, um, you know, we were introduced to a, a organization called Iliaktida. Iliaktida is founded by a lady called Vasilika. She's a nurse working for in, uh, disabled people. She's still working for, as a nurse for disabled people. But in 1990, she started this foundation, and by now she's having 400 people working for her. 
400 people working for her, and um, they are looking after of all the unaccompanied minors on Lesbos. We are providing our music program, which is actually a mental health care issue uh, for with them. Nikas and Katarina are working with Iliaktida also. Also, all those minors are coming down to the restaurant of Nikas and Katarina. They're providing a wonderful program. We are going with the music program together, Nikos Katrina, also with their restaurant. And as I told you before, I'm not standing here on behalf of Connect by Music. I'm standing here on behalf of home. So it's like asking you not to think about the pink elephant, forget about Connect by Music. <laughs> Remember home. Right? Home for a day. Okay, that's it. Okay. Because Nikos and Katarina, they gave up everything. You have to understand, like, other NGOs needing a place to store their stuff. They have a st storage house. They can use it for free. I mean, if you, whatever you need, they will give it to you. And they have nothing for themselves left. So they take big, big risks in their life. They're living by day. They don't care about tomorrow. They just want to help. Like Nikos always say, if you can help, just do it. So the reason why I'm standing here, and Nikos want me, don't want me to ask it, he's too morose for that, and Katrina doesn't want me to ask it to you. We got this flyer here, home. We were gonna, would love to take you one with you, and if you ever want to come down to Lesbos and give a hand, or want to support someone, Look at Nikos and Katarina. They're really the ones who deserve our support. And there are some people around here who know them. Who knows Nikos and Katarina? Who knows? Look wow, around you. Wow, a lot okay? of people. Cool, cool. Mr. Cook, yeah. thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as a final note, I would like to um, ask, the, by the way, um, Adrian, would you, Adrian, you stay with us afterwards so if, if people want to approach you. Uh, are you with us after, after this, this event? Yeah. You're saying, okay. And how about you? Yeah. You stay with us? Yes. Okay, cool. That's good. Cool. Uh, I would like to ask the documentary makers to join me here, please. Yes, come here. Okay. If you had else. And this is for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the final note for you, uh, because I know you both a little bit, you know you have been uh, um, involved in this uh, issue of refugees, migrants, and you have been around the block, you know, you have been in several countries, you know, Italy, Greece, you know, uh, Turkey, everywhere, you know. Uh, first of all, uh, how do you see the impact of the EU-Turkey deal till now? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, no, you. <laughs> I want to hear your opinion. I want uh, well, else. Um, and then Eve. Of course, what we see is, is very bad, the impact. So uh, we were also struck when we were there. We were really in a phase of mourning. We felt like something died inside of us by seeing all this misery. So we yeah. were very um, confused as well. And also in all the interviews we had with Gerald Knaus, we were confused and still are sometimes. Sometimes we think, okay, now we figured it out. We, have a st we yeah. stand for this. But then after a, an evening like this, we start um, doubting again. Um, and so, yeah, it is such a complicated issue. And yeah. um, I want to say something about Gerald Knaus because I have the feeling that most people are very skeptical about him, yeah. but um, we have learned to see him and meet him as a very um, passionate person who is courageous with his intellectual yeah. power and who is passionate about wanting to change for the better. So that is really something we want to give him credit for because... I guess we, we saw that, you know, yeah, he, okay, he's passionate about it, yeah. but it's at the end of the day, it's about the result. Well, that's that's a big question, of okay. course. Okay, yeah. please, yes, yeah. Well, How do you he, see? I think uh, we can all see that the deal uh, doesn't work. Well, it, it, w it depends what it's supposed to do, right? If yeah. it's supposed to solve our problem, yeah. as Katarina says, like keeping refugees out of Europe, then it's solved. It works. Because yeah. we're done, yeah. we're, we are looking away of the yeah. problem. Yeah. We don't see it anymore. We yeah. are outsourcing yeah. the refugee problem. Yes. Yeah, but if it's 
supposed to solve it in the sense that we want to still provide asylum for refugees. We tr still want to uh, help refugees. Yeah. Then, of course, it doesn't yes, solve every anything. Cool. By the way, again, thank you all so much because as probably most of us here, you know, for me, you know, as a, someone who reads some newspaper, you know, following news, you know, the EU-Turkey deal was, you know, like history, you know, it goes okay. And now I hear your story, your stories, Ingeborg, the lawyer. No, it's not the history. It's as a matter of fact, it's going on every day in a bad manner. So thank you very much for your documentary. Final question, you know, for you. And then we really have to stop at seven o'clock because we have to leave the room for the next event. Um, the NGOs, as I said, you have been, you have seen a lot of NGOs from Italy or other countries, you know. How do you see that the NGOs are doing the job that must be done by other, you know, official organizations, you know, governments, you know, are they, trying, are they fixing a broken machine, or? I think they're just saving people yeah. at the moment because the machine yeah. is completely broken. Our governments are not doing anything. Uh, if it's Lesbos, or we just came back from the border between Serbia and Hungary, where uh -huh. people are stuck uh, in the snow, in abandoned farmhouses, yeah. there's nothing there. Nobody's yeah. providing any aid except for young volunteers coming from all of Europe bringing them food, clothes, sh showers even. Yeah. Uh, and those are the people that are actually keeping these people alive. And you could say, oh, they're actually prolonging the situation. Yes, yes that was mm -hmm. I, I was. I think uh, it's a very ending. cynical approach because I, I do agree with uh, Flip Schuler and I think many people that these people will still try to come to Europe yeah. because they have a really big reason to come. Else, what's your um, take on this? Well, it's the same, I think. I, I mean, we've we've been together in this, so we've we've seen the same yeah. things. But we we definitely see the power of solidarity with young people, and that is very hope giving. And I think uh, if we look around here, there's also old people, young people. Everyone can contrib contribute, and not only by going to Lesbos, but also by pushing politicians and stalking them with emails. And please do because they will listen in the end and they will have to look to the situation there. Okay. Uh, not, not only on Lesbos. Lesbos. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, else, Afia, thank you again for your documentary. My dear panel uh, members, thank you. And the lawyer over there and my uh, hero for today, Ingeborg. What the <laughs> fuck, man? What the shit, man? Thank you. And jullie ook. Ontzettend dank voor jullie aanwezigheid. Dank jullie wel, dames. Nou, een dag als uh, vandaag komen natuurlijk, ja, moeten mensen een beetje een bijdrage leveren om het uh, tot stand te brengen. Ik wil in het bijzonder danken Eduard Nazarski, director of Amnesty International. Anja uh, uh, Holverda van de Stichting Bootvluchteling. Tim Zelstra van Oxfam. Tim, Tim, ben je hier of niet? Nee, oké. Okay. Tim van uh, Oxfam Nomi. En Els, die heeft ook een filmpje gemaakt, ook voor de, voor de online, zeg maar, distributie van deze dag. Kunnen jullie op uh, Facebook vinden. En uh, als het goed is, misschien vinden jullie ook sommige programma's die hier verschijnen, vinden jullie ook interessant. Onder andere vanavond al, Wit en Zet. Uh, in deze zaal, oh, ik heb het al gezegd, we moeten de zaal verlaten. Oh ja. En 14 maart, dat is geloof ik aanstaande week, hè? Ja, even, even opstaan, ja. Even laatste. Woensdag om uh, na nieuw, nieuw, nieuwsuur komt de film op televisie, op NPO 2. Oké, okay. dank jullie wel, dank jullie wel. Dank jullie wel.